All right, so hi everybody, John Meadows here. And today I'm gonna to give you 21 reasons why your biceps aren't growing. It's actually a combination of tips and all kinds of stuff. So stay tuned, I'm covering a lot of ground here, but let's get those biceps growing. Why your biceps aren't growing? There can be a number of reasons. So we're gonna cover a ton of, ton of topics today. The first thing I wanted to start with was your exercise uh, split. So the rage right now is these full body splits and these push-pull leg splits, which I happen to love, by the way. And there's not a lot of people that just train their arms uh, by themselves anymore. That's called a bro split. And it's apparently it's wrong. You should never do that. Well, if you're having a problem with your biceps, the first thing I'm gonna tell you, um, and by the way, we're gonna do triceps too in a separate video. If you're having a problem with your arms or your biceps, I would suggest that you dedicate a specific day for them. So if you're doing a push-pull leg split, you could do push-pull legs and then arms, and then take a day off and start the rotation over. So the first thing I would do is don't rely on um, the push-pull or full body type workouts to, get, to give you maximum develop, development of your arms. The other thing I would say is, you know, when you look at EMG studies, which I know they're not perfect, a lot of those movements, like the back movements, the different types of rows and chins and pull downs that you're doing, they're showing that you're getting somewhere around 40% of your maximum voluntary contractions. So you're not really getting maximum contraction in those muscle groups. You're getting some, but you're not getting a lot. I think that's common sense personally, but apparently it's not. So number one, I want you to actually set aside an arm day Yes, I'm advocating it just a straight arm day because it makes sense and that's going to help your biceps, number one. All right, now, number two. Um, now, I'm telling you in this video like what comes to my mind first. And the other thing, one of the first things that comes to my mind as well is it's how heavy do you train your biceps? You know, we all believe in progressive overload and trying to get a little bit stronger, but there's something about <laughs> your biceps, you gotta be careful. Um, if you're going real heavy all the time, there's a very high likelihood that you'll get tendonitis in your elbows. And I bet a high percentage of you watching this video have probably had some kind of elbow issues in the past. Some kind of medial epicondylitis or lateral epicondylitis, that's golfer or tennis elbow. You've probably had some of that. And what I've noticed through the years is that when I used to do the real heavy curls, I think I used to do 190 pound curls with a barbell, 70, 70 80 pound curls with a dumbbell, Sure, my biceps looked like they were moving a lot of weight. I was using a lot of um, cheating, doing whatever I could, using a lot of weight, and I pretty much just had tendonitis all the time, and my arms wouldn't grow. And then I'd lighten the weight up, and pow, all of a sudden my biceps are growing. You know, I was probably actually making the biceps actually use more weight because I wasn't cheating, but in order to, I think in order to get maximum bicep development, it's a unique muscle. I think that muscle, you have to be very cautious with going real heavy. You gotta be very cautious with going real heavy. So what I'm gonna advocate is more of a moderate weight. So instead of the ultra heavy barbell curls, I'm gonna advocate that you go a little bit lighter. I didn't say light, I said not ultra heavy and use strict form, which we're gonna get into. We're gonna talk about different ways of curl. But in your mind, I want you to think my form and my contractions are number one, not the heavy weight I'm slinging around. That's a very um, broad and general and vague statement, but it's really, really important on biceps in my opinion. And I absolutely got the best gains in my biceps when I did that. So that's number two, and I feel that that's very important. Okay, so I wanna build on that one. I'm telling you to use moderate weights with good form. So let's talk about intensity, failure. Do you go to failure? Do you not go to failure? Well. If you're gonna, you know, the science is very, is getting to be very clear on this. Again, I think it's common sense, something the bodybuilders have known for decades as well. But if you're gonna go with moderate weights, not real heavy weights, now you're gonna to have to do more stuff to failure, okay? So it's not gonna be good to get a moderate weight and just do some pumping, leave a bunch of reps in the tank and do it again, uh, particularly for those of you that are natural. That's not gonna create much in terms of adaptation to make your uh, biceps bigger. So since we're going with a little bit more moderate weight, 
we're going to have to take more sets to failure. Now, not only that, we're probably going to, to really exhaust the fibers, we're probably going to want to throw in some high intensity techniques. So the way I would structure this into a program, like normally, let's say I'm training chest. Let's say I pick three or four exercises. Normally what I'll do is I'll work up to a real hard and heavy set, the last set, go to failure, and then maybe on two of those four sets, I'll go beyond failure. So, you know, we get four sets that are really, really hard, and then maybe two or three that are decent in a session. Well, with biceps, it's gonna be a little different. So we're gonna talk about how to structure the workout later too, but I'm generally gonna pick three exercises. And I'm probably gonna do about three sets per exercise, but they're all gonna be to failure pretty much. So it's gonna be nine sets to failure. Um, now, that sounds like a lot, um, and it is, but again, we're using lighter weights. If we were doing something real, real heavy, we wouldn't do that many sets to failure. But again, I don't want you trying to set world records on your barbell curls, because I want your elbows to be healthy. So many people who just can't train their arms right because their elbows are messed up. So, uh, what I want you to understand is we're gonna do more sets of failure, um, and we're probably even going to throw in some high intensity techniques. And again, the, the notion there is since you're not going real heavy, we, when you're using a little bit lighter weight, the lighter the weight is, I believe the more you have to go to failure. So, you know, we're working in a 10, 12 rep range, just generally speaking, those are going to be taken, those are going to be taken to failure with good form. All right, next, you have to curl in the squat rack. It gives your arms extra tension, makes them bigger. So curl in the squat rack. Actually, I want to talk about form. So, on the other videos we've been doing, we've been really focused on basic exercises. Because I know not everybody has access to a lot of the machines I use. So I'm trying to keep these simple. So, what could be more simple than a barbell curl? So I want to start there on form. Because I also think there's a lot of uh, technique issues that for some of you is probably pretty obvious, but for some of you it's probably not. So we're going to start with a regular barbell curl. One of the reasons why your arms aren't growing is when you curl, you're doing a hip thrust, right? So let me show you what I mean. And I see this a lot. So you'll have somebody get the weight going with their hip, right? So they sit back and... So when they do that, the tension doesn't even start until they're halfway through the motion, right there. There's no tension from here to here. Okay? So... If you want to go to failure with good form and then actually throw in a couple cheat curls, I'm okay with that. But that's not what I see. What I see is people doing all the reps like that in an effort to go really heavy. Okay? And again, bye-bye tendons and ligaments. You're going to have your tendons. You're going to have a lot of inflammation. So don't do that. Now, uh, so how should you curl? Well, I think there's a couple, I think there's a couple ways to curl. You've got the standard, keep your elbows stationary, and curl like this, okay? It's right here, right there. There's nothing wrong with that. Then, you've got a little bit of a different style up here all the way. Now, the second style I see people all the time saying that's wrong. It's actually not wrong. Your long head contributes a little bit to shoulder flexion. I'm not saying you're gonna get massive biceps if you just stand there doing this. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when you get up to here and you give it a little bit more shoulder flexion, it actually works the long head of your bicep a little more, a little bit more here on the outside. So, and, and listen, just try it. Just sit there, I want you to do this, flex your arm. Now I want you to do this. And you'll actually feel the tension. You'll feel it, it's real good here, and then bam, it's even harder. So if you want to curl like this, that's great. If you want to curl more like this, up, that's great too. Play with it, um, see which one you prefer. Maybe you like them both. Maybe you want to do some heavier sets like this, moderate. To heavy and then maybe lighten it up a little so you can come all the way up um so anyways that's barbell curls all right so there were two tips there no hip thrusts okay start strict 
unless you want to add a couple cheat reps at the end. And then for a little extra contraction, particularly on the long head of the bicep, you can go ahead and take it up and squeeze. All right, now let's talk about dumbbell curls. Another very, very basic exercise. So um, this kind of relates kind of like to the hip, the hip thrust I was talking about, but people swing it with their shoulders. So I see a lot of people curling with a swing like that. And again, there's no tension at the bottom. So instead of curling, they're throwing the weight up. Very little tension on your bicep when you do that until you get to like right here. So what I want you to do is I want you to keep your elbow pinned against your side when you start. So here, okay? So none of this, all right? No swinging, okay? Now, the other thing people do is they're, they don't know it, but they're training their brachioradialis, this muscle right here. They're training that more instead of their bicep. That muscle helps you when you're in kind of in that neutral or pronated position like this. So what I see people doing is instead of supinating early and using your bicep, they're doing this all the way up and then they're doing a little twist at the end. That doesn't do a whole lot, okay? That's okay if you want to just train your brachioradialis, but your brachioradialis I mean, what people tell me is I just feel my forearms. I don't feel my biceps. And then when I watch their form, I see them doing that. I'm like, well, no wonder. You're, you're actually training like you're trying to train your brachial radialis. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to supinate very early in the movement at the bottom third, okay? So I want you to supinate down here, okay? I don't want you to come up here and then just do a little supination like that. I don't like that. So strict, supinate at the bottom, and then bam. Okay, supinate at the bottom fully. Okay, now there's a third little trick to these too. People will get the heavy weight up and they'll drop the weight down, so they just drop it down. You've got a great opportunity to, to eccentrically contract, so use a good negative when you lower it. So, supinate at the one third position at the bottom, around there. Now, real, now really put a lot of emphasis on the negative, okay? And then come back down, okay? So I want you to really focus on the negative. And I just see people paying no attention to the negative. They're coming up and then they're just dropping it. Coming up and just dropping it. So supinate, up, and then real good strict negative, okay? If you do, just those three things on your dumbbell curls, they're gonna feel a million times better. One of the big, big misses, I think, in people's bicep workouts is they don't train your brachialis. Okay, your brachialis is a muscle that sits underneath your bicep, right about right there, okay? When that muscle develops, it pushes your bicep up. So when people say, well, I wanna get a wider arm, training that muscle will help you do that. Now. I'm pretty lucky because uh, growing up in bodybuilding, I was always taught that, like you gotta develop your brachialis. So that's always been a part of my arm routines. But I don't see people doing a lot of hammer stuff anymore. And I think every bicep workout you do, you should include brachialis work. Whether it's a reverse curl, whether it's a hammer curl, I personally love hammer curls. By the way, that brachialis is an incredibly powerful elbow flexor. It's actually even stronger than your biceps. So, Make sure that in your bicep routine, you're training your brachialis, okay? So you can do it here, you can do it here, you can do uh, the easy bar with a pronated grip like that. I personally like the hammer curl better, but it is a big miss if you don't train that brachialis, so make sure you guys train that brachialis. Now, there's, a, there's several different types of hammer curls. If you want to check out a video we made a while back on different versions for you to play around with, uh, check out the video above. All right, now, another real basic exercise that you all know I love is our, it's a preacher curl. This is another exercise where I think people really mess this up. So, <clears throat> when you're doing your preacher curl, I see a lot of people doing this, okay? So they got a low curl at the top but I see him starting it like this, okay? I want you to just sit back and curl strict, okay? Just like this. So none of this, okay? 
I know that sounds simple and you probably already knew that, but man, I see a lot of people doing that on their preacher curls. And that is a beautiful bicep exercise. We're actually gonna talk a little bit more about that later in the actual programming part. So make sure you kill the momentum on these. The other thing is, is you don't necessarily need to go down all the way on these. It can be really hard on your connective tissue at the bottom of your bicep too. So go down about four fifths of the way before you come back up, okay? These are gonna work the bottom part though. That bottom part is very tough. So preach curls, I love them. Let's keep that form clean. So the other thing that's important on these is where you actually put the pad. I like to see your arm on the pad like this. So what I've done is I've set the pad too low. Now if you get the pad too low, look at where my elbows are. So it's not terrible but I don't think you're getting the most out of it. I'd rather, again, I'd rather see your arm down like this curling, okay? So just make sure you have the pad set up right. I wanna talk about the strength curve. You've probably heard a little bit about the strength curve. There are some exercises that are harder at the beginning, and there are some exercises that are harder at the end. So for biceps, for example, if you look at um, a preacher curl or uh, an incline dumbbell curl. So you're sitting on a bench in an incline position with your shoulders extended this way. The beginning, the beginning of the motion is harder. Some exercises are harder in the middle, like a barbell curl or dumbbell curl. You get that spot right from here to here that's harder. And then there's some exercises that are harder at the end part of the contraction like a spider curl over there on a preacher bench flat pad with your arms hanging down those are a little bit harder at the top of the range of motion so one thing that people do a lot is they use their exercise selection is they pick exercises that stress the same you know the beginning or the middle or the end that's all their exercise selection so they miss really maximally stimulating part their muscle through one of, the, one of those parts of the range of motion. So if you do, for example, all barbell curls and all dumbbell curls, you're probably missing a lot at the bottom or that fully contracted bicep at the top. So what I'd like for you to do is, when I think of biceps, I think basically you wanna pick out three exercises, maybe four, but generally three. You know, when you see people doing six, seven, eight exercises for biceps, there's no way they can be training with a lot of intensity because you can't do set after set after set, six to eight exercises at that high level of intensity. You can't do that. So what I want you to do is I want you to pick an exercise that works more the middle to start with. So that could be a barbell curl. That could be a supinated dumbbell curl. That could even be a hammer curl. So pick one of those three. Normally I'm gonna pick a hammer curl, but pick one of those three. Uh, your next exercise is gonna be something that stresses the contraction. So actually we're gonna walk over here, I'm gonna show you a spider curl. Okay, so one option you have for working the, the contraction, the contracted part at the top is a spider curl, and I love these. So notice the pad is flat right here. So now you can get up into the top and really contract. <clears throat> That's one option I really like. Now, let me show you another option. All right, so another way to work that contracted part of the curl is set a cable up so you're pulling from a low angle. <clears throat> now you're going to pull not just to here all the way up okay so here flex here flex so the cable is great because it allows you to go all the way up into that contraction and again remember that full contraction at the top is a lot of the long head of your bicep the outer part so that's another option so 
I would typically, oh, you know what, while I'm standing here, let me show you another exercise. Here's another uh, option. This way. You could, use a, you could use a curl bar on this too. I actually smash the dumbbells together when I do these. Big contraction. Big contraction at the top. So that's another option you can try. So that would be where I would put my second exercise. Now, what I like to do ideally by this point is have a crazy pump in my biceps, full of blood. That's when you hit them with the stretch exercise. So that's when you would do something like this. You remember when I said that these work the bottom part of the range of motion the most? So now we're working the bottom part of the range of motion. And it's giving you a stretch. So see the stretch I've got right here? Very hard at the bottom. So that's one option. Another option would be that basic preacher curl that we did. So just to kind of recap this, you start with a kind of a mid-range um, exercise, regular dumbbell curl, hammer curl, barbell curl. Then you go to something that works at contraction real hard at the top. So you pump a lot of blood in there. And then once your arms are full of blood, then you hit them with the stretch, okay? Now, sometimes what I do, I started doing this in the 90s when I was training John Perillo. He was a big believer in uh, stretching. So sometimes what I'll do is when my biceps are really pumped up, in, in between sets, we'll also do a stretch. And it could be normally this is what we would do. Just a basic, put this part of your hand against something flat and just stretch. 30 seconds on each bicep and then hit your next set and you can alternate. That's fantastic. Um, and I don't think people really think about stretching their biceps a lot, but it's just like any other muscle. You want to put it to a full range of motion and you want to stretch it. But a lot of people just haphazardly kind of program it into the bicep workout. I'd rather you do this when there's a lot of blood in the muscle first. So let's get the joints feeling good and the muscle pumped up. And then we'll hit it with the stretch. Now there is if you're fortunate and you train at a gym that has variable resistance, variable resistance machines, you've got a lot more flexibility. I'll show you what I mean. So if we come over here to one of the prime machines. <clears throat> so like with these prime machines, you know how I was talking about some exercises stress the bottom part of the range of motion, some are more in the middle and some are at the top. There's machines that are made now that allow you to change that with this, this cam right here. So right now we have it set on a one, which means it's going to uh, stress more the middle part of the range of motion, like a barbell curl. So this is more simulating a barbell curl, but we can change it. So if we change the cam to number three, it looks the same, but the bottom is now really hard and then it's easy at the top. So the bottom is now being stressed. If you unwork the top, now you move the cam to number two. Now it's easy to get out of the bottom, but now at the top is hard. So if you have these, these machines right here, it's awesome because now you can hit all three in one exercise. What I would do a lot of times on this machine is two sets at each setting. So six sets for biceps, but two sets straight in the, the middle, two sets at the top, and two sets at the bottom. I know you all don't have machines like this, but just in case you do, I wanted you to know that it's easier for you to hit all the different, uh, you know, parts of the range of motion equally. So, and I would say you don't have to, you know, a lot of people are talking about strength curves and they're trying to make it perfectly equal throughout the range of motion. You don't have to have a perfectly equal <laughs> stress level throughout the range of motion on every exercise you do, okay? It's good to have to fight through a part of the range of motion on exercises sometimes. I think it's good for you to do that. So don't think you have to have on every single exercise you do a perfectly evil, or evil, it is evil if you do it all the time, uh, even level of stress throughout the entire range of motion. Anyways, so that's strength curves. So some of you may actually 
be um, feeling more of the stress in your forearms and not in your biceps. So there is a subtle change in technique that you can use to help lessen the forearm work so you get more in your biceps. And it's real simple. Instead of gripping like this, you just let the weight kind of hang, okay? So instead of curling like this, I'm gonna let it hang. Now there are two exercises that I would use this for. One is a drag curl. That's when you're dragging right up your body like this. That's all bicep. And the other would be just a normal cable curl here on the machine. So if I had one of the little handles, I would do the same thing. I don't like doing all your exercises like this for biceps. I don't like trying to do it with dumbbells and, and all the different preacher curls. I think that change in grip is uh, it's good for isolating biceps, but you, you got to be careful with it though. I don't like the feeling that it puts on your wrist in some exercises, but drag curls is good and cable curls, I think it's really good. So if you're having, you know, if you, if you feel in your forearms too much and you, and you never change your grip to something like this, you, you might be missing out. So the way you grip the bar is also very important in how much stress you put on your biceps. Okay, so another thing, this, it's a unique concept. And if you guys remember, I used to use these grip things called grip force. I really liked them. I liked them a lot, actually. And the theory behind those was you have to squeeze the entire time uh, you're doing the curl. Like those little grippers would actually, the bar would come out of there if you, if you didn't keep it closed. The principle behind that was called muscle irradiation. So theoretically, when you're squeezing something really hard, you can get more uh, muscle contraction. Now, it's not just in your bicep, it's everywhere. And when I was over at Westside Barbell in the mid 90s, they talked about that to get maximal contraction in all the muscles you could, when you bench press, for example, you squeeze the bar. You didn't just grab it in your hands and press, you actually squeeze the bar. So that's something that I, that's a lesson that I learned from Westside Barbell that I carried into a lot of stuff. So when you're doing biceps, now this is, I don't wanna say it's the opposite of what I just said, but it's a different technique. So you can actually squeeze the bar real hard and you theoretically get more muscle activation. Now it's gonna be more in your forearms too, it's gonna to be more in your forearms, more in your biceps, just because of that muscle radiation. So you're squeezing the bar real hard. And by the way, that's something I love to do. On all my bicep work, I'm always squeezing. Um, the other thing is, I, I also, I like for my forearms to get engaged too, because I think if you have weak forearms, it really limits your bicep development actually. So I wanna train my forearms, I want them strong. I want that brachialis strong from the hammer curls. I want the brachial radialis strong down here. So that's a pretty cool technique that, you know, it works on like your pressing, for example. I don't wanna to get too far off topic, but if I'm doing say incline barbell presses with someone, if I tell them to squeeze a bar, you can literally see the bar coming off their chest faster. They can generate more force. And that's what we're shooting for here. So muscle irradiation, squeeze the barbell hard, or dumbbells, squeeze them hard. Earlier in the video, I mentioned going to failure and sometimes using high intensity techniques. So there are many, many different things you can do. I would only do one of these per exercise. So if you do say three, three exercises, three sets, well, only on the third set would I use a high intensity technique. So let's talk about a couple high intensity techniques. You can use partials uh, as a high intensity technique. So let's say you're doing dumbbell curls, okay? Remember, supinate at the bottom. Remember, emphasize the negative. Let's say I can't do anymore. Let's say this is my eighth and, eighth and final rep can't do anymore but I can still do partials so here keep it going keep the reps going you can do that with a barbell too just work the bottom third that'll light up your biceps something else you could do iso hold so let's say you're doing single arm okay remember we're not throwing it supinate and strict okay an iso hold means let's say you do your eight reps you hit you, you can't do anymore you hit failure so now you do an ISO hold on your eighth rep. You come up and then you hold right here. You count to 10, right there. And if you wanna make it real hard, have your training partner push down on your hand too, okay? Ooh, that hurt. Um, or you can do a drop set. So you get eight, you go to failure, then you drop it 10 pounds and you keep going. So my point is, is to take a couple sets of your workout and use the high intensity technique. 
And this is why I don't really like cheating on exercises because you get a little bit of injury risk and you put, generally you put a little bit of extra stress on connective tissue. The older guys know this. Um, I like to teach the younger guys this and learn it while they're, while they're young. You don't need to cheat. You have so many different options. You could just lower the weight and keep your form strict and get the same thing without tearing your body up. Or you could just do partials. You could do things like this that I think will tax the muscle even more and do it more safely. So to me, I mean, do you want to cheat a little bit? Yeah, I guess you can, but no one can convince me that you have to when you have all these different options available. Drop sets, partials, ice holds, there's a whole bunch of different things. You do negatives, you can have somebody help you with four straps. You have somebody help the weight up and then you just do negatives. There's all kinds of stuff you can do that allow you to keep your form good and extend the set to, to make it become a very intense set. So there's that. Okay, I mentioned that having weak forearms wasn't a necessarily a good thing. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that in terms of your grip strength. Now, a lot of people have a very, very poor grip strength. I was actually one of those people. Um, if you have poor grip strength, your grip will give out a lot of times before your biceps will. I've, that's kind of the boat I was in when I used to use straps for every single thing I did. Now you notice when I, use, when I use them for my back, I only use them maybe one time for the heaviest set, if that. So you, it's very wise, I think, to also train your grip. You don't even want to have to think about your grip, especially when I'm telling you to grip stuff hard. So I, got, I had a lot of success actually training my grip, and what I used was those grip force, um, those grip force handles. I don't know if they even still sell them, but you could get something like fat grips. Um, you could get those crusher things. Some gyms have the forearm machines. But my point is train your grip. Get a really strong grip so it's not a limiting factor when you're training your biceps. All right, so we've talked about exercise selections, volume, intensity, angles. We've talked about everything. I wanna throw one more out at you and it's a really old school technique and it's just flexing your arms. So you'll notice, remember the old school bodybuilders like in the movie Pumping Iron, in between sets, like if they're training their chest, they'll flex their chest. If they're training biceps, they'll flex their biceps. It's, it's actually good. It develops your mind-muscle connection. So in between your sets of biceps, don't be afraid to just kind of just flex your, flex your bicep. That's okay. And even when you're not in a gym, you're just sitting at home, maybe not when you're walking down the street, but when you're sitting at home, it's okay. Just sit there and flex. Try to really develop that mind-muscle connection to where you can feel a hard contraction. So do that in between your sets too. It's going to get more blood in the muscle, but again, the goal of that is mind-muscle connection. And the better your mind-muscle connection is, the better your results will always be. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, we, we covered a lot of ground, form, exercise selection, intensity, volume, we covered all that stuff. So I hope you find this valuable. I uh, appreciate all your support. I hope your 2020 is off to a great start, and we'll see you next video.